I can bring you in warm. Or I can bring you in cold. This is where the fun begins. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 65 of Jedi Knights, the official Star Wars podcast of Joy Clicks. I'm your host today, Christian Buckley, joined by my Chewy, Mike Connors. Um, you know, it, you're, we're going to have to talk about the High Republic and everything, and there's a really great Wookiee character mm-hmm. uh, in Light of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. And so once we once we both finally finish that book, we're going to have to talk about maybe maybe changing it instead of my Chewie mm-hmm. to that other character, but we'll have to see. Yeah, So, or we could just both be Wookiees. Would you rather have the bowcaster or the, the crossguard lightsaber? Oh, I, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I feel like the crossguard lightsaber would sort of be a hindrance. I would be afraid of like uh like cutting off my own wrist or something sure sure um so bowcaster yeah that's fair how you doing mike i'm good man how are you doing pretty good uh back again episode 65 today you pointed out right before we started recording episode 66 is next week so for the memes it's gonna be a big one so look forward to that yes um also worth mentioning we did a bonus episode of jedi knights uh, between episode 64 and this episode 65 with Kayla Karloff. We did a whole breakdown about season two of The Mandalorian, looked at uh, gender roles in it, how The Mandalorian, Din Djarin, uh, sh- sheds a lot of stereotypes and tropes for badass bounty hunters. It was a very interesting conversation. It's available uh, on the playlist on Joy Clicks' YouTube channel as well as the podcast feed if you're an audio listener. So if you missed it, that was the bonus episode. Uh, this is episode 65, so we will get to Lucasfilm Games talk, the Ubisoft Star Wars thing, and of course, High Republic discussions. Of course. But before all of that, why don't we kick the show off the way we normally do, with the Jedi Archives. We're pulling from the sacred texts of Wikipedia to educate each other and anybody listening along on something in the world of Star Wars, canon, legends, Old Republic, High Republic, sequel trilogy era new republic that's the name of it um really anything (laughs) yeah so mike why don't you educate us with something in star wars right now so i'm not sure if i had pulled this one in the past but i chose the t-16 skyhopper okay um so they were personal repulsor lift airspeeders manufactured by incom corporation Mm -hmm. um so the wikipedia page here the canon wikipedia page says that it only cost 7500 credits which like i don't know what the going rate the conversion rate between credits and us dollar is mm-hmm. but that seems like not a lot of credits um which would make sense because it seemed it was a civilian craft luke skywalker had one mm-hmm. um and uh yeah one thing that's interesting about this while i was reading this here wikipedia page uh the controls were similar to incomes t65b x-wing starfighter which uh, benefits Skywalker during the Battle of Yavin. So, so I guess I kind of like if it, people were always like, how did he how did he get um, the per- permission to be an X-wing pilot? I guess because he already had some experience with those controls. Yeah, that's that's a fair point of reference. Um, I'm wondering now though because you you bring up the economy. Do you okay. think <laughs> do you think moisture farming is a profitable endeavor because if you think about it if you're on a desert planet like tatooine moisture farming seems like it should be a big deal and they're probably living large out on the lars estate but for some reason as a kid growing up i always saw luke as being like lower class i don't know why you know that's really interesting because i did too and you have to think like you know even like the lars homestead mm-hmm. um, on tatooine is like pretty big like it, it looks it looks like nice for tatooine standards you know sure. like think about think about like where anakin and shmi were living mm-hmm. compared to like the lars homestead so yeah maybe like it would make sense that moisture farming on a desert planet like tatooine is profitable very lucrative so yeah maybe he was like secretly secretly rich <laughs> yeah i know ne- i never considered that at all but me either that's crazy the price of that skyhopper is making me think um so i i pulled one as well for this week uh yeah. something that i think we talked about when we did the segment fire the cannon <laughs> when we were like trying to decide what should be flushed out or not oh yeah yeah, yeah. so i had pulled sifo oh jedi master sifo okay 
Sifo Dyas was a was a human male Jedi Master who served the Jedi Order during the last decades of the Galactic Republic. When the Sith were revealed to have returned during the invasion of Naboo in 32 BBY, Master Sifo Dyas secretly commissioned the creation of a clone army, placing an order with the Kaminoan government before he was murdered by his friend, Count Dooku. Very, very interesting. Yeah, because... I was always under the assumption that, like, Palpatine just made the order for the clone army under the name of sifo and that's what the thing was. I -hmm. didn't realize that sifo actually decided to make, like, order the clone army, and then Dooku killed him to seize control over it for his master. Yeah, I mean, do you think, like, Count Dooku, it was, like, sort of like count dooku was maybe like hey man you should go do this thing <laughs> i don't know i don't know because like at the time wasn't count dooku a, mem- a member of the of the order because i don't know yeah that's interesting because obi-wan doesn't realize that dooku is a sith until he gets captured right mm-hmm. so that i could see that sort of makes sense timeline wise because it's saying he sifo has ordered the army after maul showed up so like i guess that timeline would make sense because if you're wondering like when would dooku turn presumably it has to be after maul dies or dies you know so yeah between between episode one and episode two for sure yeah Uh, it's interesting like on uh, yeah i don't know exactly how the um like the timeline sort of shakes out so it's possible that maybe he just did this on his own thinking that it would benefit the republic and then mm-hmm. like count dooku at some point just like marked him um mm-hmm. for palpatine mm-hmm. but like yeah it's interesting this um the wikipedia page does have a quote from mace windu who says uh, prior to the blockade of naboo sifo diaz sat on this council until he ju- until we judged his ideas to be too extreme interesting uh, yeah so take that and chew it i guess yeah <laughs> yeah well uh that concludes the jedi archives for this week but mike you gave me a perfect segue because speaking of extreme jedi great guess who's been in the news this past week um i feel like i know right yeah i I don't know if i want to i don't know if i want to spoil it should i spoil it yeah tell me who's been in the news uh none other than uh the esteemed jedi qui-gon jinn yeah um so yeah, very interesting that he's back in the Star Wars news after so long of not being in it. So yeah, because I remember I want to say maybe a two within the last two months there was an episode we were we were talking about a quote from uh, I almost called him Qui Gon from Liam Neeson where he was saying that like oh I look back so <laughs> fondly on shooting the Phantom Menace it was the most fun I ever had mm-hmm. on a set I had a, a blast doing it. Um, it was a very wholesome quote, but he's back in the news again this week because uh, there was a clip of him that was going around. I saw you mentioned you saw it as well of him like showing off his lightsaber for a talk show or something. And um, Liam Neeson's a very very large man, so like seeing <laughs> his hand holding the hilt of Qui Gon's lightsaber, I was like, wow, that thing looks tiny compared yeah. to him. Um, so that was fun, but he also had an interview with collider over the past week and because the obi-wan kenobi series is underway we're shooting it right now uh collider asked him in their interview with him for his whatever project he was promoting about kenobi and there were some interesting things that people have been reading into so first up they mentioned to him that like oh fans are really excited about the idea of you returning and qui-gon coming back uh, he had no idea, apparently, that uh, there was a, a fervor or at least an interest among Star Wars fans for Liam Neeson to come back to Star Wars. I don't know how he didn't know that. <laughs> well, it, it does feel recent, right? I feel like I never saw people saying, "I, I man, I want Qui- Qui-Gon back until it was confirmed that Ewan was back, you know? Because it was always Ewan is Obi-Wan, Ewan is Obi-Wan. Well, I mean, if anyone was going to come back first, it was going to be Ewan, right? right? Mm-hmm. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, Liam Neeson first. So, like, once Disney admitted that, yeah, we have Ewan on to be Obi Wan Kenobi in this in this this new TV show, this miniseries, or whatever it is, like that kind of opened up the floodgates for maybe Liam Neeson to come on board as well, or for 
for Star Wars fans to think, oh, if, you know, Ewan's coming back, maybe Liam should come back too. Mm -hmm. Uh, So maybe that's why we've been seeing a little bit more talk about it recently. Uh, So that is a good point. Yeah. Um, And we've talked about Qui-Gon before, especially when we reviewed Master and Apprentice. I've always really liked Qui-Gon a lot. Maybe that's why I was scarred by the end of The Phantom Menace, because I saw him die, and I was like, no, he was so cool. <laughs> um, I mean, like, as a kid, you watch that movie, and you're like, oh, no, not Qui-Gon. Yeah. And then, like, they never, they never talk about him again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> except for except for episode three, which, you know, we talked about a bit before the podcast. Yeah, so episode three, you know, uh, after Order 66 goes down, yoda and obi-wan are discussing their plan and Obi- uh, yoda says he's been visited by an old friend and obi-wan's like oh qui-gon so he's like i have training for you obi-wan like you gotta go to tatooine <laughs> and you gotta learn how to be a ghost so because of that collider asked hey you know we're getting this obi-wan series makes sense that you know obi-wan would be talking to his dead master to become a ghost you uh you hear about this you want in (laughs) and his response was interesting because he said and every single report i read of this said through him like smiling he said sure i'd be up for that yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah he's he's in that he's in the show yeah Mm -hmm. it's almost like it's almost just like you I i don't know how you would make like uh a miniseries about obi-wan kenobi without addressing that right like how do you how do you sort of like cast this character in this time period of his life without having him sort of like reflect on his past Mm -hmm. and that obviously includes uh qui-gon and we saw through master and apprentice that that relationship was like pretty strained at some points like they didn't really get along um like until until you know their their relationship sort of grew and obi-wan was o- always sort of more uh like dogmatic and and, and qui-gon not so much so there's a lot to be explored there um, especially since his uh, qui-gon's death was like so sudden and there wasn't really that opportunity for o- obi-wan and qui-gon to like have that moment with each other on mm-hmm. screen at least yeah i for any chance i can get for them to actually flesh out qui-gon more i would be a one million percent down for because like I said, he's always, like, I sort of, as a kid with the prequels, I viewed Qui-Gon the way I viewed Obi-Wan when I watched the original trilogy of, like, wow, he's clearly the coolest guy here, and then he's gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we do get to flesh Qui-Gon out more through being a Force ghost, sure, if we want to get another book about him, that'd be dope. Uh, oh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I think it's pretty safe to bet and assume that, at least for an episode, qui-gon will show up because mike you made a good point about um their relationship and fan speculation coming along with this kenobi show with like anakin or vader or now qui-gon and i think the reason for that is because tell me if i'm off base here but i feel like (laughs) obi-wan's never been the main character you know yeah I mean, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to say because I do think that like the prequel trilogy, mm-hmm. he he's so tied up in Anakin's story, yeah. and obviously the prequel trilogy, the central character is Anakin Skywalker. Mm-hmm. But like, you can't have the Anakin Skywalker that we see in that prequel trilogy without Obi Wan. Like, right. he he's so integral to his character that he's almost like the ultimate supporting character if not like the second main character of the of the movies yeah because like you know he has to go he has to deal with anakin like he has to deal with like anakin from like a father level right like Mm -hmm. oh my son is like going crazy (laughs) like you know what i mean right um so so i mean like yeah i don't think he's ever been like the the main character proper but i think that he's been such an important character that like he may to me he's like you know, if if it wasn't Anakin Skywalker, it would be Obi Wan. Wouldn't be the second most right. like important character. Right, and I I think other characters in other trilogies fall into that role a lot. You know, like I think Leia and Han are probably in that as well. Like I don't really think they're. If you boil it down to just its core, the main characters are Anakin, Luke, and Rey. You know, totally. And there there are people that are a strong second. You know, like Kylo Ren 
or Obi-Wan. Um, so I do think, can I say, I do think that Ray and Kylo Ren are supposed to sort of, sort of share the sequel trilogy. I, Maybe that's just because I thought Kylo Ren's story was a little bit more captivating. Sure. But that's me personally. Um, so I think because of that, the reason that fan speculation went off is because Obi-Wan is a supporting character, really. And he's, like, I think you... To get the Obi-Wan we know, I think we still need an ensemble, you know? And what fan casting would go for an ensemble that's completely new characters, you know? It's like, oh, of course you want to see him with other characters but paint the whole thing from his perspective so i think that's why a lot of this makes sense i think that's why they are going through with these castings because if you suddenly make obi-wan like the capital m capital c main character i feel like you could lose what makes obi-wan obi-wan to so many people you know yeah and i just think there's a lot to explore there too right like we saw you know qui-gon die in episode one and then immediately obi-wan has to be like yeah i guess i gotta take care of this kid now and train him in the force right and then like the next movie jumps like whatever it is like 12 years or something Mm -hmm. and we never actually get to see him sort of like deal with that Mm -hmm. and like you said like i do see what you're saying like it's hard to have obi-wan without like the support of like all the other characters around i don't see how you can have the show without qui-gon honestly I um, agree. So, mm-hmm. it's really exciting. I'm happy that I'm like he's he's definitely hiding something, Liam Neeson. Like, you know, we've seen it a lot. Like, uh, you know, potential characters, potential actors, actresses um, being asked if they're going to be in a future Star Wars project, and they always say no. And most of the time, they show up. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, it would just make too much sense. I think he's in the show. I agree. Um, I did not put this on the dock, but you just reminded me because of the car- people, actors denying uh, involvement with projects. We have an update on Rahu Kohli, you know, the fan okay. casting for Ezra Bridger. <laughs> Dude, like, it's the Rahu Kohli saga. Like, every single time we're like, is he, is he Ezra? <laughs> so he actually tweeted this out this morning. Let me pull up his Twitter. But I truly believe he is not Ezra. Really? Okay. Yes, because... We've seen, Mike, we've talked about it so many times on this show. There's been actors that are rumored, and they're like, oh, I don't know, I haven't heard about that. Uh, Or, like, I have nothing to comment on, or that kind of thing. That is, like, typical actor speak for Mm -hmm. everything, you know? Um, Rahu Kohli, two hours ago, muted the words Ezra Bridger forever. And he also tweeted... Um, what else? I think he might have deleted this tweet, but uh, he said something to the effect of like, uh, the Ezra thing was just like it started as a joke, and then people got carried away with it, and then he turned it into like a trolley thing. But he said he's like lost all interest in it now, and it's like kind of annoying. And I think he said he was gonna start like blocking people that are asking about it or something like that, like. You don't say oh, yeah. that if you're hiding something. <laughs> like, that is full-blown, like, yeah, I was having a laugh. That's kind of, like, mean of him, though, <laughs> right? Like, like to, like, lead everybody on in that way. Mm-hmm. To be, like, to be like, oh, yeah, like, maybe I am Ezra Bridger. Mm-hmm. Wink, wink. And then just, like, totally go 180 and just be like, no, no, never. I'm mm-hmm. never going to be Ezra Bridger, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, th- I mean, like, I see where you're coming from, though that is kind of suspicious. Sure. Like, I wonder I wonder if, like, Kathleen Kennedy, like, called it. It's like, dude, you gotta shut up. <laughs> like, maybe. And it is worth noting, I can't find the tweet where he said it was a joke and everything. So maybe he deleted it. Maybe, like, his agent was like, hey, maybe, the, maybe we're working on this. I don't know. But, like, I wanted to update it. So... Uh, yeah, to- totally. I mean, it, how funny would it be if, like, he got a, he actually got a call from Lucasfilm and then he just, like, immediately got on Twitter and was like, guys, this isn't funny. I'm not- <laughs> <laughs> sure. So. Um, well, we have another update. Uh, we talked about Lucasfilm Games last week. Yeah. Because yeah. on the show, we were recording in time with the Lucasfilm Games announcement. And then... Uh, that day they announced indiana jones we discussed it a little bit we were like hey star wars and we were both kind of like nah not too likely the day after the morning after (sighs) yeah story of this podcast's life yep 
Mike, we bounce around recording days throughout the week, like every season, and mm-hmm. always they find a way to just avoid us. I know. I think we were like, oh, you know, we can record on Tuesdays. Maybe we'll we you know, be able to actually pick up all the news that we inevitably miss on yeah. Monday night or Tuesday morning. But no, nope, I guess they just changed that to Wednesday. Yeah, they know. <laughs> so this is exciting because Ubisoft yeah. and Massive Entertainment announced that they are teaming up with Lucasfilm Games to create a story-based open-world Star Wars game. Uh, As of this morning, I saw a member of the Massive Entertainment team tweet out that the team is currently hiring a narrative designer, which, if you're hiring a narrative designer, a few years out, I think. Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah. I I don't even really know what that means like like so, what is a narrative designer like somebody who creates like works on the story yes yeah, so like a narrative designer i think from my familiarity with i read a lot about games industry stuff i believe yeah. it's more of like on a conceptual level like okay major story points how will these story points be delivered to the player will they have agency in the story how will that work mechanically so the story could already be written potentially but just the method of delivering it might be what they're working on and like retooling the story to fit that method um maybe like conceptually in terms of a gameplay standpoint they've already established that because i did see some people read into the announcement that it sounded like they might have been working on this in the background for a little bit but to me it does feel like it is a, a ways out yeah i mean i didn't think that it was any time it was going to come anytime soon no um I don't know. I didn't hear any of that about like you know people speculating that maybe they had been working on it for a while. I'm sure they have. Like, it's kind of uh, uh, Star Wars has a bad track record track uh, track record of announcing games and then it never coming out. Sure. Um, and I feel like they're probably trying to like not have that happen again. Mm-hmm. Um, so they probably did put some development into it. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this is not coming out for a while. I don't think. Yeah. Um, now, for listeners who are unfamiliar, Ubisoft, of course, they do Assassin's Creed, a lot of big AAA, big budget games that sell very well. You're probably familiar with a lot of them. But specifically Massive, who is the team making this game, Ubisoft is just going to be publishing it. But Massive is uh, the Ubisoft team that makes the Division games, Division 1, Division 2. I've played Division 2. Uh, they are wonderfully talented at crafting environments and worlds because I've never been to Washington, D.C., but Division 2 takes place in Washington, D.C., and I feel like I've been to Washington, D.C. Like, it's it's very, very good. It's very accurate, good attention to detail. So the idea of them tackling a Star Wars world or worlds, very exciting. Yeah, I think we were, so we were talking about this last week, Christian, and mm-hmm. we were sort of speculating, we were talking amongst you, both of us, we were like, you know, uh, EA, their contract uh, to use the Star Wars IP is expiring, um, mm-hmm. and so we were sort of speculating whether or not, <clears throat> you know, they were going to keep their exclusivity in terms of the Star Wars IP, and it, with this announcement that answer seems to be that they're not mm-hmm. um so that's that's interesting on that level um we'll, we're definitely going to start seeing i think more star wars titles that are not just um you know uh ea published so mm-hmm. that's 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 good i'm interested in that but that doesn't necessarily mean that ea is not going to be involved um anymore with star wars they actually there was a polygon article i think that specifically said otherwise mm-hmm. so you know, there is still a possibility for Battlefront 3 here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I will pull up the EA Star Wars tweet because there was an official um, sort of calming tweet they sent out after the announcement a few hours later. Uh, they said something to the effect... It was like one of those things they had a list with like the check mark emojis. They were like, bd one still the cutest droid. Uh, we're still making uh-huh. Star Wars games. Like, stuff like that. Um, so... I will find the official wording, but yeah, EA is still going to be making Star Wars games. Uh, it just won't be exclusive, like Mike said. They will be most likely, I think it's safe to assume, based on the sales, Battlefront 3 will come eventually. Jedi Fallen Order yeah. 2 will come eventually. They could do a new thing, you know? Nothing's to say that they couldn't just make a new game. Um, and apparently, 
they said to like keep your eyes out for new announcements from ea star wars this year so well that's cool yeah. um I mean, I was kind of surprised when they announced Squadrons, to be honest with you. Um, sure. Like, I wasn't expecting them to come out with another game so soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's interesting in, in and of itself. Um, question for you, though, Christian. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think... Um, so, this is going to... So, they, they have announced... Um, Ubisoft and Massive Entertainment have announced that this is going to be an open-world Star Wars game. Mm -hmm. That could still really mean anything, right? Yeah. Um, what, what kind of game, like genre wise do you think this is going to be so i think the obvious thing would be to go off of their track record with the division uh the division does very good shooting it is gun-based combat uh really interesting cover mechanics uh for maneuvering through the streets through buildings um and it's very tactical which i like a lot um it, it, it allows you to like plan out movements um, in ways that other cover shooters like an Uncharted or a Gears of War don't let you. Like, I, I really appreciate it on that level. So I think there is a tactical approach that they could take to a shooting Star Wars game, but like a third person shooter in an open world. Um, and when I think of guns and Star Wars, my mind goes to bounty hunters so yeah. that's that is the thing that i think mm -hmm. makes the most sense based on their track record now will this implement multiplayer at some point i could see it i played the division probably like 50 50 solo and multiplayer i thought both were excellent experience in terms of the player perspective so if they can replicate that and make a really fun solo with a really cool multiplayer component I think, honestly, there's a chance that it might be my favorite Star Wars game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, just looking at, you know, Star Wars Jedi, like that series, mm -hmm. um, and then also just, um, yeah, really just Star Wars Jedi, like, it seems like if they're going to make, like, a lightsaber-based game, like, they are one, they already did that. Mm -hmm. Two, like, it seems like Respawn is making a, a, Jedi, a Star Wars Jedi 2, whatever mm -hmm. that is. So, you know, we're going to have some lightsaber action there um yeah it, it, i think that there is precedent for just like a bounty there's obviously precedent for just like a bounty hunter star wars game yeah and i think that that would work really well with this um i i didn't i've never played the division so i take you know i i, I think that what you're saying is that kind of interesting actually because that would work super well with bounty hunters right. <laughs> and like i could see it work with a like a trooper style story as well yeah. like it, anything with guns in star wars i think it could work with but like when you think of a star wars gunner type thing bounty hunter in my opinion is a bit cooler of a concept than average trooper depending on the era you know yeah they should make a star wars bounty hunter game with like the tactical shooting of of uh you know, like, like yeah the tacticality of the division mm -hmm. but like with some serious like rpg elements where you get to like choose what kind of type of class of bounty hunter you sure play. well it, it's funny you say that too because the division is class based oh is it okay interesting. yeah there, cool. there's four classes and that plays into multiplayer uh as well because you could be like a tanky dude you could be a healer you could be really well ranged good with tech so like i think nice. there's a lot of like dna here that would translate really well into a star wars game a question about the division i'm just kind of interested like how how rpg -y is it like is it at all um, oh yeah oh yeah you got you got okay. skill trees you got uh gadgets you can level up through use uh you got uh gear of course to level up find a new world um oh nice yeah dude like we just need that <laughs> like translated into the star wars universe yeah like, i think the only thing i would want improved is like out of a star wars game from the division team is verticality because traveling upward in the division kind of does not exist you are really just a lot like on flat surfaces going up stairwells so i think bounty hunters i think jetpacks i think grappling hooks so like maybe implement that on top of the dna that's already there um now mike this game is probably ways out i think oh, totally. yeah. there's a world where this game is set during the high republic because if this game comes out let's say at the earliest in 2023 which i think is realistic um 
I think by that point, the High Republic will be very established as a big pillar for Star Wars. And what better way to continue that than with the first post EA game? Yeah, I think um, just just the fact that it's been announced now and everything as well, um, um, with like the High Republic being kind of on everybody's mind, mm-hmm. um, I would be surprised if it wasn't High Republic related. Mm-hmm. I think it's more likely than not that it is. I we, when you look at something like Shadows of the Empire, which is like Lucas films like first big publishing effort Mm -hmm. where they sort of bridge the gap between episodes five and episode six with with books and comics and a video game and i think like why couldn't disney and you know lucasfilm lucasfilm games do that now um i i would want us honestly after reading light of the jedi and we'll get to that like later on in the episode i would i absolutely would want to see something in this era of star wars galaxy um it's Mm -hmm. super interesting and um there's a lot of like there's just a lot to be explored um but but to be fair i would honestly be fine with like any sort of like even the sequel trilogy like that type of era just give me something man i yeah <laughs> I, th- I think i think you're right that's probably i would guess that it's probably like a high republic themed like set in the high republic but that's just a guess yeah and i I think, again, because I'm really just judging it off the division, I think the way they explore cities, you could do an interesting thing with uh, High Republic Coruscant and just have a couple different layers of Coruscant we can go to. That could be interesting. Um, Different planets? Different planets as well could work. And I think the division makes so much sense too because like, and the High Republic, I think it, it all just makes too much sense because the High Republic gives you enough separation where there's events you can create for this game that don't interfere with other things. Uh, there's no Sith that would be everywhere, you know? So if it is a bounty hunter-based game, the enemy could still be the Nile. So just say, sure. like, the Nile take sure. over a couple layers of Coruscant, and the the Jedi are off-world, so you gotta hire some bounty hunters to, like, clean up Coruscant. Like, I feel like yeah, there's a lot of op- opportunity to build off the foundations of the Division with the higher public, with the scenario of bounty hunters, it makes too much sense to me that I, like, that's what I'm expecting right now. And the final thing I'll say about the Division too, because I know some people can get nervous when I say gear, um, Division 2 is, like, kind of going for the Destiny thing, but it, it still is a really good single-player experience, I think. The story... I could not tell you a single thing about the story of the Division Two, <laughs> but I think making it Star Wars gives you the benefit of okay, there's going to be something that's going to fit in with Lucasfilm, and uh, Pablo Hidalgo is going to know exactly what's going on here. Like, I, I yeah. think any worries you have about the Division having gear or a looter thing, I put those to bed. I think because even monetization, the way the Division was monetized, there's like a season pass, there's an expansion, so like I. Don't worry about it. Ubisoft has pr- usually been pretty good about the way they do that. Also, I feel like, you know, after the whole EA Battlefront 2 debacle, mm-hmm. um, Disney's, Disney might be a bit more sensitive about those things as well mm-hmm. um, and sort of try to, like, nip that in the bud before they have to deal with the uh, press onslaught. Maybe. Sure. And I, I think um, Ubisoft as a whole, I think the biggest controversy they've had in terms of spending like that recently was Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Not the most recent one, but the one before. There was, like, I think you could pay like 10 bucks for uh, XP boosts to like allow you to get through that world faster. But like the progression in game is good enough. It's just like if you're pressed for time and you were like, I just want to see more of this game, I'll spend money so I can level up faster. Like, yeah, but that doesn't hurt anybody, you know? So totally. Yeah. It, it seems pretty no, ex- fair. So. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, I think what you said about twenty twenty three at the earliest is probably correct. Yeah. All of this. Mm-hmm. So, um, before we move on though, this EA business, uh, what do you expect is there to share for this year? Do you think we get an official title or teaser for Jedi Fallen Order two like we were speculating? I don't know. I think um, I don't think we're going to see any releases from EA yeah. on the Star Wars front this year. Um, I think next year is is probably some, I think we're going to definitely hear something from them. They, I think you even said earlier in the episode that they that EA themselves said said so. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
Yeah, I don't know. I think it's too soon for Battlefront Three. Is it? They though? just ended. Like they just ended live service, right? Yeah, but the game came out in 2017. You know. True. That's true. I, so. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it's either it's it's either Je- like Star Wars Jedi Two or or Battlefront Three. I, yeah. or something else i don't i don't know but like they those those especially since disney is sort of giving the star wars ip to a bunch of different developers i don't think like ea is going to start branching out on like newer projects for yeah. anytime soon i agree i think that's a pretty safe bet like i don't know if we'd get a squadrons too i could see squadrons be like a mode in battlefront 3 that's just really fleshed out but yeah yeah, I think you're right. I think Battlefront and Fallen Order are the safe bets for EA Star Wars in the future. I think, you know, if they're going to do anything with Squadrons, they're just going to, you know, update the game as it is now sure. um, for a while. I Yeah, I don't know what to say. I can't say, like, whether we're going to see Battlefront two, 3 or, you know, Star Wars Jedi 2 first. I have no idea. Like, it could be, it could be either. I would be happy to see both. <laughs> um do you have any dream team-ups for another like game company to work with lucasfilm to make a star wars game i don't want to put you on the spot but you kind of are putting me on the spot (laughs) because i'm not super like well versed in these things Mm -hmm. though i will just like very much just out of out of my you know out of nowhere just say i am jealous that bethesda is making an indiana jones game uh we should we should have an rpg style maybe i don't know fallout star wars from bethesda or something i don't know yeah that'd be cool like if they tackled um or obsidian even i think because a lot of obsidian did uh they did code or two so like just xbox give out the money be like hey obsidian we want them to work with lucasfilm they're gonna make a new canon kotor game that is exploring the mandalorian wars or something totally uh well i mean i wasn't i didn't really give the best answer to that question because i'm not super well versed but i'm gonna i'm just gonna flip the the question back to you Mm -hmm. uh who do you think who do you think is the best like like what would you want to see like i i'd throw from software out there but that's basically jedi fallen order already like we kind of got that so um let's see let's okay okay here we go um i want just because playstation is very much about like fathers and their children as like the story for video (laughs) games and they do that a lot um a game that plays like god of war the reboot um but it's about qui-gon and obi-wan oh okay i thought you were gonna say the mandalorian and grog (laughs) oh no 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 no. (laughs) that'd That'd be be cool cool, too yeah qui-gon and and obi-wan is a good idea yeah, just because the thing is, you can get both of them back too. You can get you and you can get Liam Neeson. Just have them mocap everything and really let them flex. Be them looking like they're fresh out of Phantom Menace, doing a really solid story to bridge Master and Apprentice and Phantom Menace. I mean, like, could you imagine if the story to Master and Apprentice was was a video game? That'd yeah. be sick. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, we are excited for the future of Star Wars games yes. here. Always. Uh, there's a few fun topics I wanted to throw out there that weren't too inconsequential, but uh, let's go through them real quick. First up, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is free to own on the Epic Games Store. I believe that is still available. Uh, they do free games every week. Uh, last week, I think last Thursday is when it updated, so it should be still live, but on Epic, you I think get... it's mm-hmm. Yeah, to the 21st, you can get it. And also, you can get the Celebration Edition, too. Yeah, which is very good. Um, so if you listen to this show and you haven't played it yet, there you go. It's a great game. Yeah, you really have no excuse at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Light of the Jedi, which we will talk about later, uh, has topped the New York Times bestsellers list for its debut. Not surprising. (laughs) Yes. Very nice. uh, Very good for the future of this era, probably. And uh, I'm sure they expected this great for charles soul man that must be like that must be like everybody's dream oh yeah Mm -hmm. like like a writer's dream to like top the new york times bestseller yeah because he as far as i know he's been tied down to comics for a while like specifically with star wars but 
breaking out into novels and hitting on your first shot. Well, I, I actually do know that he had written two novels before he wrote Light of the Jedi. Um, and I think they did well, but like, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Kevin Keener, Kiner, perhaps? Um, the artist who scored and composed for Star Wars The Clone Wars confirmed to be returning to score The Bad Batch. So if you needed any more evidence that this is just season eight of Clone Wars, there you go. <laughs> Literally. Um, yeah, honestly, the, the music to, to The Clone Wars is, is good. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I'm happy about this. I honestly didn't really know his name, but great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I learned his name through uh, TikTok because of a lot of people memeing oh. the Burying the Dead, I think, is the name of the song from the finale when, like, Ahsoka's burying the clones and then uh, uh, Vader finds the lightsaber. So good good music. Good music. Totally. Uh, and lastly, Mando Season 2 finale tops the Nielsen ratings, which uh, measures TV ratings, uh, streaming service ratings. I don't know how to do that, but they do it. Uh, yeah. But we talked about this last year. Season one for Mando did the exact same thing. No real surprise. The Return of Luke Skywalker will get people watching no matter what, even if they haven't seen the rest of the season, I'm sure. You know, sometimes, um, like, when I look on Wikipedia for, like, other TV shows, they have, like, um, like a graph of, like, a season and, like, how how many people watch it. And you can kind of just, like, see over the season, like, which episodes are the most popular. Mm -hmm. I want to see something like this like that for for mando season two i'm gonna have to like uh go in excel or something like that yeah I, I wonder if the um the boba fett episode had more or if it was the luke one yeah i don't know it's, yeah. that's interesting though yeah um that's it for the fun news though so why don't we get to a little discussion about the high republic light of the jedi by charles soul yes uh mike you have finished the book <clears throat> I have, yeah, I actually finished it uh, two two days ago. Maybe actually it was yesterday. Nice. Um, I am only briefly beyond what was available, and I, I think it was like the eight chapter chunk from uh, yeah, the preview they they put out in December. Um, so by next episode, I'll have fully read the book, and we can do a full spoiler talk next week if you'd like. Um, For sure. But... I think we should. I think we should do a spoiler talk when you've read the whole thing. Oh. Which... Wow. Um, absolutely for sure so we can just give some impressions you know about light of the jedi what we think of it so far um again no spoilers yeah no spoilers um I'll, I'll shout this out those eight chapters are still free if you wanted to read them you can go check it out um to see what you like of it or see what you think of it but sure um i guess my major thing so far i'm surprised at how fast it moves yeah so i mean like not going obviously not going to get into spoilers or anything i've read the whole book and like that's one of the main complaints i have with it. really okay i i think like it was just it was just like a lot and like i'm not sure that's really like charles souls fault. i think like in a way it's sort of supposed to be overwhelming mm -hmm. but yeah i did find myself like halfway through like kind of feeling fatigued like oh my gosh like how many new characters how many new spaceships how many new planets like like it's just a lot to take in like new villains names like and you have to like, remember all of them so it was a lot it sort of seemed to jump around in a lot of places and yeah that's that's probably one of the main things that i have with the book but um yeah <laughs> yeah i i mean i feel like you're gonna run into that issue when you're trying to establish a new era you know like mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing to do i found like charles soul's writing i do like like the way he writes the world and it, I, I think he's done a good job with what i've read so far of visualizing the higher public and making it feel present even though it's like so in the past of this series that we know like he does a good job at that for sure Oh yeah, I mean, so I mean, it definitely has the same feel of Star Wars, right? Like it takes place in the same galaxy, and you feel that when you're reading. But there is something different about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to like put a pinpoint on it. Um, you're honestly like, this is not really a spoiler. This is the first line of the book. Um, like 
the the Republic at this point in the in in the Star Wars universe in the in in sort of the timeline of it all, they call it the High Republic for a reason, and the first line is all is well, right? Yeah. So he kind of like paints this picture that the Republic is like this this glorious like utopian place, right? Um, and I I think that's really interesting because we know we know where the Republic goes just by watching films just by watching the films and everything and it'll be interesting to see like how over the course of the higher public they get from you know everything is perfect and and mm -hmm. we love everyone and and they have this this phrase in the book like we are all the republic right yeah um, that is uh interesting because that that feels a little culty and i, I yeah mm -hmm. yeah that, totally man. it's it's cool because you can definitely see that's the thing that stood out to me so far for sure in terms of like planting a seed for their downfall because it's they're so cocky like i know <laughs> and i i really like that because yeah at the same time like i feel like the characters and the cast are, they're, they're still likable even though there there is that cockiness to them the way that some of my least favorite members on the council and the prequels <laughs> are cocky you know um sure but yeah, I do really like the the way that the Jedi just feel present everywhere, you know? Like, it is a lot, like you said, but I think, from what I've seen so far at least, it, it's a good way to diversify the High Republic so it doesn't feel like too much of a cult, you know? <laughs> like, they're, yeah, they're still well, opposing views, you know? Right. And I think that, um, you know, when you talk about opposing views, like the whole book, the book starts off with like, oh, like everything is great. Like the Republic hasn't been in a conflict in like forever. Mm -hmm. And then um, the villain of, I think, the High Republic, the Nile, um, soon make their make their way into the story. Mm -hmm. And the, they are an extremely formidable villain. And that's kind of something that I thought of before I read it. I was like, like what like how could they how could they come up with some sort of villain that knowing where the jedi go like how how are they going to make them like like <laughs> i don't i don't know how are they going to put any sort of like weight behind them you know sure. like how are they going to actually make them like a villain that you're scared of mm -hmm. and they definitely charles soul at least definitely does that he 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 makes the denial out to be like something really scary um you know and and even to a jedi it, it would be scary um sure. so and uh, one thing i've liked so far and i'm curious to see how you feel about this having finished the novel like i i do like that the nile feel very different than the sith because the sith to me while they are like pure evil and r like rage fueled it's weird because they like with the exception of, I guess, a couple characters that deal with the Sith and the Dark Side in the Skywalker Saga, they feel like they have a grasp over the rage in a weird way. Like, they feel very elegant still. Um, sure. Where the Nile are much more... Again, they're written to be space Vikings, so they, like, revel in it, which I think is really mm -hmm. interesting. I feel like the only character, Sith character, that we've seen that does stuff like that and acts like that is to me maul but we really only see that in like clone wars maul so this does feel very new yeah. to me yeah the nile are are, are savage mm -hmm. like they really are and and you know throughout the entire book like you're reading it and you're like all right like these guys are kind of mean like <laughs> you know like like they, they're definitely like not great guys and probably should be uh, extinguished doing a lot of bad stuff around the galaxy but like as you get to the end of the book you start to like really understand like how savage they are mm -hmm. um there's there's not uh, like there is a point i'm not gonna say spoil it obviously um at the end of the book where you read it and you're like oh sh like crap like wow like so 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 mm -hmm. there are those moments um and and i think that that's that's cool how they were able to make that um seem like an actual truly fearsome villain so one thing I am hoping to see, and this is just the first part of the High Republic, so we'll see where it goes, but I'm hoping that by the end of the book, I get a little bit of a sense of purpose 
behind the Nile more than just like we want to be bad and do bad things you know like is mm-hmm. is there going to be some political thing involved like for, do they have a leadership that strongly opposes the galactic republic colonizing the outer rim like did, yeah i don't know if this book will touch on it but i hope if it doesn't uh future novels do because i think with the nile mm-hmm. being so brutal i think making them formidable against the jedi and then giving them a strong head on their shoulders would make them very very interesting beyond just we need people that can fight jedi you know yeah i mean obviously i'm not going to get into the into any of the details but like um this book does sort of get into the like deeper motivations um which i think is which i think is really interesting um and you know touching on that um the Nile as like a body, you know, they are like a villainous force, right? Um, but like, you know, the the vil- like the, the the villainous character in the book, uh, Marquion Rowe is his name, and he's like part of the Nile and everything. Not gonna get too much into him, but he's really scary and like pretty cool. And yeah, he's like on he's like, to me like so far he's like on the level of like. Like honestly, like kind of like a Palpatine, but like we'll see. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I I think clearly both of us are sold on the era so far. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And excited for the future. That goes without saying. Like, I think it's a strong first endeavor. Again, <laughs> only what, like I'm a little over a third of the way through the book. Um I I think the higher public it like you said mike it feels new but it feels like star wars which i think is exactly what they needed right now um Mm -hmm. it is cool to see the jedi um flexing this way i'm curious to see what nuance we get out of the other i'm assuming adult books you know i don't know if like into the dark will touch on that much or if that's just going to be more of a character thing about these two uh the master and apprentice in that um the rising storm is the next one and we can touch on this more next week about what that might be about but the idea of the like traumatic event that shakes the galaxy at the start of the book um seeing where they're potentially building in light of the jedi and the idea that the rising storm is the title for the next one like I'm feeling like there might be a swelling of like bolstering the forces of the Nile or something like that, which I think could be very, very cool, especially if the main antagonist and like leader of the Nile is that Palpatine esque force that you hope he is. Yeah, obviously, I'm not going to get much into, you know, whatever the end of the book is, but um, let's just say that, like, yes, I see where they're going with it um, okay. after having read the book. Awesome. That's very good to hear. Um, yeah yeah it, to, honestly man like i was a little skeptical with the high republic i was kind of like well like like not 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 skeptical in the high republic in the sense that i wasn't super hyped for like all the new star wars content mm-hmm. it, more in the sense that i was sort of skeptical in like the the actual like era like 200 years before the phantom menace like how much different can you really go mm-hmm. right it's not that far away from like you know the invasion of naboo or something like that mm-hmm. but i'm sold on it now just purely on the fact of like how charles soul sort of like brushes like this galaxy and like where they are and how he sets the scene and everything Mm -hmm. i just think it's it it totally makes sense and like yeah like it, it like like we know where the jedi ends up we know where the republic ends up so we know that it's like eventually heading towards bad stuff for both of them Mm -hmm. right so like understanding like that and then like reading this book and seeing how he sets up the world makes me extremely excited for it and i actually was listening to star wars explained had this like 45 minute interview with charles soul and he said that you know disney essentially brought in all these authors and were like you can do a star wars you can do this anytime like really like it's up to you like Ten thousand years before the phantom menace ten thousand years after the phantom menace like 200 years in the middle of something doesn't matter Mm -hmm. and they chose this period and i see why it's really interesting christian it's hard to talk about this without getting into spoilers so Mm -hmm. i'm really excited i'm really excited for the moment where where we can actually get into the nitty-gritty of the song 
Yeah, and I'm I'm hoping that Star Wars news is pretty tame for this week, and I'm assuming it will be. You know, like there's big yeah. world events going on this week, so most media companies don't tend to align announcements and big news with those sorts of things. Um, yeah. So I, I hopefully there won't be too much that draws away from the higher public talk next week, but rest assured, everything we have to say about higher public, we will get out there next week for sure. Oh, for sure. You know, I, I, yeah, I have more thoughts on like the, the book itself that I think maybe we should just say it for when we talk about like, you know, mm-hmm. the details of, of what happens. So, yeah. Um, but I, I think so far, and again, I'm working my th- way through it. I could end up hating it. I doubt that will happen, but um, <laughs> I can say I doubt, I doubt you'll hate it. Yeah, sure. yeah, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> just I want to put that out there in case. But I will say this: I can recommend it so far, just based off the like the first almost half alone. Um, if you were ever curious about reading Star Wars, if you just got on board with the sequels, if you got on board with the Mandalorian, um and you like reading you want to read more i think this is a perfect topping on point for anybody who has the slightest like whiff of star wars love you know because it is a new era that we're all going to be able to experience at the same time and the flow of content for this era is going to be almost non-stop for like two years so yeah we're not getting a lot of movies you know we're getting some plus shows the end of this year and whenever bad batch drops but if you want to keep that star wars train going i think this book absolutely is a great start you know we're going to pick up again with claudia gray in february and then rising storm beginning of summer but i i think i can highly recommend it based on what i've read so far in terms of a hopping on point for a new era for anybody really who has any interest in star wars i think it's very welcoming yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely recommend this as well. Um, mm-hmm. I, I thought it was, I thought it was a really great book. I, I do have my issues with it, sure. which I think we, we, we can talk about, you know, later. There are some pretty glaring issues that I have with it, actually. But mm-hmm. like overall, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really awesome ride. It was really fun, and um, yeah, I'm just excited to see where they go with this in the future. Um, I, I would say that like, you know, if you don't know anything about Star Wars at all, this might not be the book for you um but if you are like extremely interested in star wars you love the movies and the tv shows and stuff and you like christian said want to sort of expand the lore on your own this is something new no one is uh no one knows about it like you to me it's not as daunting as like going and reading you know legends material right i agree right so i mean this is a great jumping off point um and I'm excited to just honestly personally keep up with this kind of stuff uh, yeah, me too. because because like I haven't like, you know honestly I was just too young when like a lot of the legend stuff was coming out mm-hmm. and at the by this point like it's not even relevant anymore exactly so yeah, so, yeah like it, it's great it really is I'm so excited Christian yeah me too and I I think the one last thing I'll add on there too just in regards to like beginning to read star wars like even the canon books we do have we we read two of them for the show i do think there is a dauntingness there because it's like so when does this fit in with the movies and like what show is around here this is completely ground zero like eventually i i'd be i'd be very interested to see if we get a higher public book that is like the end of the higher public and the transition period leading up like 10 years before phantom menace or something but literally they can do anything because think about 200 years in our own history america's what like 300 years old right yeah less but less than that yeah so think about like how many things historically have happened in for like north america the usa in that time period like there's a lot that went down you know and you could say that the events that happened 200 years ago in the U.S. have d- directly led to this point. S- the way that a higher public thing, like the events of Into the, or sorry, Light of the Jedi, will eventually lead to Revenge of the Sith, but like, it's such a separation in terms of your ending to the Jedi Order, right? So like, 
Uh, Literally, they can do anything they want. Any story, any arc they want to do. World's their oyster, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. No, totally. Uh, yeah, And what makes it unique, honestly, is that, like, in a way, we kind of know how it ends. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, we know, we know that the Republic turns into the Empire. We mm-hmm. know that the Jedi are all killed, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Like... It, especially like when i read this book for the first time and i was like the first the first sentence is literally all as well and i was like i was like let's see how this ends up <laughs> <laughs> like like this is not gonna go well exactly yeah. yeah so um i you're right that is very interesting um and i'm sure the writers are having a field day tr- like writing around that knowledge because if they're writing this they clearly know the movies very well and they've talked with the experts so like the way they tease that, the way they, like, write about the confidence of the Jedi, knowing full well from, like, a meta perspective where we're going, I that's going to be very exciting to see unfold across all the books, so. Yeah, yeah, just just uh, laying the seeds of hubris. Yeah, that's exactly. That's what we're doing. So, uh, I am excited to keep reading. I will absolutely be ready for full thoughts for next week's episode, but uh, Mike, do you have any closing words on Light of the Jedi before we wrap up? Just that I think everyone who has an interest in it should read it. Nice. I agree. Well, uh, until next episode, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mike P. Connors. Very nice. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and TikTok, Chun2D2. Um, this show is available on YouTube.com slash JoyClicks if you're watching the video version. It's also available on audio services like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your audio service of choice. If you can rate or review on that platform and you do so, it would be greatly appreciated because it helps the show out a ton, allows us to reach more listeners, uh, grow this Star Wars loving community even more. Um, and if you want to get involved further, patreon.com slash joyclicks, you got a $1 tier, you get a $5 tier, you get producer credit for all of our shows and shout outs on all of them, including this one at the $5 tier over there. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's the show this week. So. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, I'm excited to uh, return next week for episode number 66. Yeah, that's going to be a beefy one because we're going to have some yeah. high Republic impressions. We're going to have some fun Order 66 segments. It's going to be fun. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, look forward to that. But until then, we're fine. Everything's fine. How are you? May the Force be with you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You're right. Beep is up.